Hey guys, welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna. I graduated the IB in 2016 and have been working with Lantana ever since. I'm a soon-to-be Durham University graduate with a psychology degree and I'm really excited because today is the first of an eight-part series where we're going to be going over the eight topics in ESS. And what we're going to be doing is, first of all, going over a general idea on the themes and the message of each of these topics, as well as going into a little bit more detail on one subtopic that I think students particularly struggle with, that I struggled with when I was a student, and that really are a good foundation to build on. So the first thing that we need to get clear is about the environmental movement. And this is the idea that around 60 years ago, people started really paying attention to the consequences of some of our actions. So what uh, the impact on the environment was of pesticides, unsustainable practices, burning fossil fuels, etc. And we talk about in the SS the different levels of influence that can really change the environmental movement, that can change its direction, that can change its amplitude. And the smallest level is, of course, at the individual level. So it's people like Rachel Carson when they write the Silent Springs book and where she outlined the effects of DDT on food chains in terms of biomagnification and bioaccumulation. And we have people like Al Gore who wrote, who did the An Inconvenient Truth documentary where he outlined the effects of climate change and how it was happening at a rate much faster than anyone knew or believed in at that point. So when these people do, um, when they create these changes at the individual level, it can really have an impact on the environmental movement itself. And actually Rachel Carson is believed to have pioneered the modern environmental movement. Moving up from that, we have independent pressure groups, also known as NGOs or non-governmental organizations. Now, these are groups that are not affiliated with any government, but that are so important in the environmental movement and rely on the use of media and the public in really putting pressure on governments. Because of course, as we'll get to in a second, they're the ones with the real power in terms of legislation. So if we, sh we, if we entice them enough, they can really get those um, concrete changes down. So of course, governments, they're the ones who can impose legislation, taxing, um, policies to really help the environmental movement along. And finally, intergovernmental bodies, so governments working together, is a crucial part of the environmental movement. Because as we will see in episode six, um, environmental issues like acid deposition really cross the national boundary. And it wouldn't be sufficient for just one government to care and try and tackle the issue. It really needs an intergovernmental cooperation. Um, and an example would be the United Nations. Um, and of course, also historical events, so critical things that happened in the course of history, such as Chernobyl, I'm sure you guys have heard of it, um, when the nuclear reactor blew up, leading to a cloud of nuclear isotopes spreading across Europe and beyond. That really taught people about the use of nuclear reactors. And that's just one example of how when a critical thing happens in history, it can change the environmental movement critically. And that brings us on to environmental value systems. And an environmental value system describes your evaluation or your outlook on the environment as a whole. And we can split that into ecocentric, anthropocentric, and technocentric viewpoints. Now, going into ecocentric a little bit more, it describes an outlook where the earth is really at, it, at the core of your values. And these people really want a holistic worldview and for people to live sustainably uh, in a way that minimizes impact to the environment. So tries to preserve its ecological integrity. In contrast, the anthropocentric environmental value system really puts people as their number one priority. So they see resources as here to be exploited by humans and instead think that focus should be applied on sustainably using them but compared to ecocentrics who think that the environment and its inhabitants are the ones who are the priority, humans are at the center in this value system. And finally, we have at the other extreme, technocentrics. And they think essentially that technology is able to solve 
any environmental problem that we face from reaching our carrying capacity to fossil fuel use to acid deposition, that through science and technology, we can solve any environmental problem. And they really focus on economic growth as a priority. So now that I've told you about the environmental movement and the three different environmental value systems, I want to move towards the systems approach. And this is a framework that the IB apply to many different environmental issues, be it soil systems, water systems, ecosystems, and very interestingly, which I'll show you at the end of this video, even an environmental value system as a system. And so to, in order to understand that, let's define what a system is. A system is a set of interrelated parts working together to make a complex whole. So just at the top of your head, you might already be thinking of uh, things that we discuss in everyday life that are a system, from an organ to a whole human being. They are a set of simpler parts that work together to create something that is greater than the sum of its parts. And um, using the systems approach involves um, a few things from simplifying something that is quite difficult to conceptualize at the detailed level um, in a way that we can make predictions and make it more comprehensive. And we can also outline the inputs and outputs that it involves. And again, I appreciate that it seems very theoretical right now, but I really love the systems approach because you can apply it on such um, a magnitude of different levels. Um, and we also have emergent properties arising. And I, again, I hinted to this when I talked about organ systems and human beings and the fact that the whole system is able to do more than what the individual parts are able to do. So what are systems composed of then? Well, they're composed, first of all, of storages. And storages are where in the system energy or matter remain when they're not in motion. Flows, on the other hand, are when energy or matter move between storages. And you can see on the diagram, it would be when energy or matter move between the producers and the consumers, uh, from the consumers to the, de to the decomposers, etc. And these flows can either be a transfer when there's just a change in location and no other change to the actual form, or a transformation where either the chemical nature, the state, or the energy form of the energy or matter is changing. So this is going into a little bit more detail on the technical side of the systems. And systems also obey certain laws, two in particular that we'll go over in the IB. The first being the law of conservation of energy. Now, this law states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it only changes from one form to the other. So in a system, the total amount of energy remains the same. All that changes is the different versions, the different forms. For example, light energy from the sun being transferred into heat energy. And the second law of thermodynamics is the law about entropy. And it says that over time in a system, the entropy or disorder increases. And the reason for this is because energy conversions are only about 10% efficient. So 90% of energy is lost. So you might be looking at these two laws and noticing some kind of contradiction. You know, I just said, that we have a total amount of energy that doesn't change. And in the second law, I said that 90% of it is lost. And what I mean by that is that 90% of energy is lost as heat. And heat is a, still a form of energy, but it's a form of energy that doesn't allow us to do work. So it's a, not a useful form of energy. And that's why we see a general increase in entropy. And systems are also subject to the laws of equilibria and feedback loops. So Equilibrium is the tendency of a system to return to its original state following a disturbance. And we can describe equilibria in two types of classification. Firstly, in terms of its activity. So there's a steady state dynamic equilibria where there's always constant inputs and outputs, but the overall state remains the same. And there is a static equilibrium where there's no activity at all. In terms of Stability, we can have a stable or an unstable equilibrium, which as illustrated in the image below, um, an unstable equilibrium is where you start an entire new equilibrium following a disturbance, whereas an 
a stable equilibrium is able to find its original equilibrium following a disturbance. And that brings us to the idea of negative and positive feedback. Now, this is something students always get confused on because negative feedback intuitively sounds like something bad. Um, but in fact, negative feedback is the one that's really great for um, equilibrium and for species uh, because it's the one that negates change and tries to make sure that the equilibrium doesn't deviate from how it started. Positive feedback, on the other hand, is the one that amplifies change away from the equilibrium, so a vicious circle. And a great example of negative feedback is predator-prey interactions, how um, when a prey um, is in plentiful kind of supply, uh, predators can increase in population size because there's a lot of food and their population can thrive. But then um, when that happens, it means that there's more pressure on the prey species. Uh, which causes their population size to decrease. And you can see that those two mechanisms keep the equilibrium the same. Um, and the third kind of thing I want to mention in this slide is resilience, which is the ability of a system to return to its original state following a disturbance, which I hope you can see is governed by negative feedback mechanisms. And the idea that I want to close with is that, as I kind of hinted at earlier, the IB really want you to think of the system's outlook on a range of scales. And the one that I find most interesting is that they think that your own personal view on the environment is a system. It's, it's the output of your experiences, your personal characteristics, your background, what the people around you think, what you were brought up with, and what you were taught in in school. Um, what you read in the news and, and what you hear around you. And that's all for the first episode, guys. Do have a look at the exciting parts two through eight. Um, and do have a look at our website. I am a tutor for Lanterna, along with many other talented individuals. So if you guys want to have us for online private tuition, we would be happy to do so. So yeah, have a look at our website and I'll see you in part two.